Good morning, or good afternoon, or maybe good evening. Muy buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. You know, we don't know when you're watching this or listening to this, but all of us at Southwestern are happy, honored, proud, and grateful that you are here with us this spring 2021 semester for Business 123 Introduction to Investments. My name is Frank Paiano, and I am using, for the very first time, Google Slides instead of Microsoft Putrid Point. I mean, PowerPointless. PowerPoint! Because of this wonderful feature that Google has, where it is doing its best to close caption the presentation. Very cool, huh? And I will introduce myself in some other part of the learning environment on the class website and in Canvas. So I will dispense with the introductions, but just suffice to say that I am truly humbled and incredibly happy to be your instructor. And we're going to embark on a journey of discovery and learning. And hopefully for some of you, this could be the start of a very uh, fun and exciting and profitable career, either as an individual investor or as a professional in the industry. Hmm? Hmm? Well, I will do my best to instill upon you the love that I have and for, the, uh, in, for investments. And hopefully some of you, maybe more than some of you, will become the best investors the world has ever seen and professionals in the industry because it is my goal. And I'll tell you this again, don't worry, I'm going to repeat myself often. To make this the best class you have ever taken. I know it sounds a little over the top, but it is sincere. So welcome everyone. Welcome and let's get started on Business 123, Introduction to Investments. We start from the very beginning <laughs> with a perspective. It is a gloomy moment in history. Never has the future seemed so dark and incalculable. The United States is beset with racial, industrial, and commercial chaos, drifting we know not where of our troubles. No one can see the end. Yeah, folks, I don't know about you, but it's January 6th, and I was supposed to have done this much earlier, but the events of the day sort of took hold of me, and I was glued here on the computer watching and reading about the destruction of our nation's capital and gee, you know when was this written today <laughs> january 6 2021 when was it written in uh in the great De recession the great depression uh world war ii no you have to actually go back to 1847 when there was a uh, <laughs> peculiar institution, you don't call it slavery, call it the peculiar institution, which was still raging in the South. And it seems like we're heading for another civil war. Oh my goodness. But anyway, um, did they have serious issues back in the 1840s? Yes, the nation was about ready to tear itself apart in the civil war. Do we have serious problems now? Oh, yes, we do. The nation is about to... No, no, it's not going to happen, folks. It's not going to happen. Democracy will prevail. And you know what? With all the gloom and doom that you see every day on Skunk News... I'm sorry, uh, what was it? Um, Weasel News. Uh, Fox News! <laughs> the truth is, times have never been better especially economically. The last 200 years, the last 20 years, have been the most prosperous years in the history of the world. Does that mean our economy is perfect? No, far from it. 
We have tremendous issues that we have to deal with, not the least of which is the inequality that is baked into our economic system. You know, folks, capitalism might be just the worst economic system ever created by us humans, except for all the others. So our job and your job, your, your generation and you uh, coming of age and, and going out into the workforce, your job and our job is to make capitalism better, is to uh, share the wealth, although that's sometimes called socialism. No, no, no. We want, we want people to succeed economically because that makes us investors more wealthy. <laughs> so I'm going to have a, a um, bias toward the positive. I firmly believe that the next 20, 30, 40 years will be better than the last 20, 40, 50, 200 years. I firmly believe that we are looking at the greatest economic expansion in the history of the world ahead of us. And we've already lived through the greatest economic expansion in the history of the world, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years behind us. If we don't blow ourselves up, die in our own waste, roast ourselves, uh, tsunami, uh, uh, earthquake, meteorite, COVID, <laughs> disco returning. Yeah, I, some of you don't believe me, but you didn't live through the disco era. So, so we're going to accentuate the positive, realizing that we have a lot of work to do. And that's where you come in. Because some of you are going to be starting out in the industry. The industry needs more women. They need more minorities, bilingual. They love ex-military. And you're going to help everyone succeed. I know it sounds like an advertisement. My apologies, but it's sincere. It's sincere, people. So let us get started. And this chapter one is, is more than just chapter one in the book. We, we talk about the book in the syllabus, so I'll let you listen to that. If I were going to write a book, which I'm not, dear students, this is what I would have put in the first chapter. An overview of the investment universe, a brief history of risk and return, and that's the chapter one in the book that we use and read, you know, what, read and, and listen to the syllabus commentary about the book. And then time horizon and short-term investments. What I've tried to do here is create what I believe should be the contents of the first chapter of an introduction to investments textbook. And so we start with a very, very intuitive quote by Mr. J. Kenfield Morley. In investing money, the amount of interest you want should depend upon whether you want to eat well or sleep well. Now, I would have, I would have um, exchanged the word, substituted the word reward instead of interest, because interest is just one re reward that we receive from our investments. But this man encapsulated the entire investment universe in this one saying, do we want to eat well or do we want to sleep well? <laughs> because the two are mutually exclusive normally. But given the techniques that we're going to learn in this semester, we can eat reasonably well and sleep reasonably well. Because investing is easy. I'm sorry, investing is simple, but it ain't easy. And that's a quote, I should put that quote on the slide. That's a quote from Mr. Warren Buffett, one of the world's best investors. And what does he mean by that? Investing is simple, but it ain't easy. Well, he's right. He's absolutely right. The intellectual part of investing is relatively straightforward. Now, there's a lot of details that we're going to learn and techniques that we're going to learn. And uh, don't worry, they're not that, they're really not that hard. Don't think that the math is going to be hard. All you need is, a, as we say in the syllabus commentary, a, a calculator that does add, subtract, multiply, and divide. If you can figure out how to use a spreadsheet, that'll make life easier. But you don't need it. All you need is a, is a simple calculator. So that's not the hard part. And, and the, the material is not that hard. You just got to learn it. You have to study it. And that takes time, folks. You just can't. Some people, there's a few people, once you they read something, they hear something, boom, they have it for life. And I'm not one of them. And not many people are. It's about 10% of the population. 
the rest of us have to study. We have to create our study guides and our flashcards or whatever, however we study. So it takes repetition. But you're going to find that it's not that hard. It's actually very simple. Well, how come Mr. Buffett says it ain't easy? Because of emotions. And what we're going to do in this semester is learn how we can use those emotions that we get when we when we invest and and help uh, deal with those emotions. Because it's not the intellectual that's going to hurt, burn you in, in the world of investing. It's the emotions. And we're going to learn that it, the news is good as long as we take a long-term perspective. But just calm, calm, because why? Most of you have no experience whatsoever, and that's great. Maybe some of you have some experience, and maybe it wasn't too, too <laughs> pleasurable. And then that's fine, too, because we're going to start from the very beginning. We're going to learn how to eat well and sleep well. Slide number four. We start from the very beginning with the question, what is an investment? Well, what is it? Uh, it well, and here's a definition. And I want you to study this definition because it's going to sink in. It's going to make more sense when you look at certain types of investments. You're going to say, oh, I can see where this one fits in and where this one fits in. So, so, so it's going to take some time, but, but, but study this this, this, um, this definition. An investment is any vehicle into which resources can be placed with the expectation that it will generate positive income or that its value will be preserved or increased or both. So in other words, we're interested in income and we're interested in growth. And some have both. Now, here's a definition from Mr. Benjamin Graham. He was Mr. Warren Buffett's teacher. And we'll come back to Mr. Graham often throughout the semester. An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. And what does speculative mean? It's a fancy word for gambling. <laughs> And so we're going to learn that some investments are more risky and some investments are very are much less risky and then some investments are downright speculative and those we don't even want to call investments but we'll get, we'll get into the the subtle definition and 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 the, the difference uh, uh more and more as we go along and so Remember when we said Mr. Moorfield used the term interest? I would have used the term, term rewards or returns because investment returns basically come in two flavors. The income, interest, dividends, rents, also called cash flows, and the increased value or decreased value. The increased value is, is called capital gains or capital appreciation. Yippee! <laughs> And then some might lose value. Those are called capital losses. And what we're going to find this semester is that investments come in all shapes, flavors, and sizes. And so in this first chapter, we're going to do an overview of the investment universe. And so we're looking at, we're going to look at the, uh, at the investment universe from flying it you know, 40,000 feet looking down upon the, the landscape. And we don't get into the details in this chapter, okay? So when you uh, start reading things and, and hearing and watching, just take it for what, it, what it's worth. Don't try to read anything into it or, or worry I have to learn more about it. No, all you need to know is what is in this presentation, okay? Okay, good. But go back to this this this. Uh, Definition often, any vehicle, any uh, instrument where we can put resources in and it will either generate income, cash flows, or it will increase its value or both. And sometimes some of them lose value. Well, that comes with the territory. So what are the different types of investments? Well, we're starting again from the, from the, uh, the, the, the 60,000 feet we're looking down. There are three major types of investments. Securities, 
property and personal investments. This class concentrates on the first. And securities, you know, I don't think it's the best word to use. I don't know if I could come up with another one. Maybe financial investments. That's, that's what they are. But they represent debt or ownership. Either you're lending your money to somebody or you're becoming part owner in, a, in an enterprise. Or the legal right to acquire or sell an ownership interest. Why do they have to add that to the definition? Well, it's important because as we'll go on, as we get towards the end of this semester, we'll learn that securities are uh, very, very complicated in some instances. And those are the ones we should stay away from anyway. <laughs> but the ones that we're going to concentrate on are fairly straightforward. And those are, are not that tricky. But just remember that a security is a financial investment. Whereas property, sometimes called uh, hard assets or real estate, is something that is tangible. Tangible assets, commodities are examples. Land, building, buildings, precious metals such as gold, automobiles, art and collectibles. These are things that you can sort of uh, 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 slap at or kick at. <laughs> Whereas a security, what is that? Well, a stock. What is a stock? Well, we'll discuss that, but you can't really, I mean, they used to give out certificates. They don't even do that anymore. It's all electronic. And then the third type of investment are personal investments. Huh? What you're doing right now is an investment in yourself, education, training, travel. And it turns out, dear students, that often the best investment a person will ever make is an investment in themselves, college, um, or just um, bettering yourself in the, uh, in the world of travel and, 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 um, and maybe an apprenticeship. Why? Because, it, because they can't take it away from you. <laughs> right? You, somebody can steal your, your car, steal your house, steal your Bitcoin or whatever, whatever you invested in, but they can't take away the, the knowledge and the experience and the training and the travel that you have done. So congratulations. I'm proud of you. And I'm going to do my best. I've already said this. To make this the best class you've... Okay, I'll, 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 I'll get off my soapbox. So, but remember, we concentrate on securities. Now, at the end of the semester, we'll spend a little bit of time discussing real properties, real estate, precious metals. Eh, real estate is a whole world into itself. And the others, for most people, they're just not that good investments. And we'll see why later on, but eh, stick with us. Okay, um, now, so hopefully you've got either the study guide or you're making your study guide and make sure you... You, uh, you know, jot down however you learn, uh, however you study, because these, all these terms are, are fair game. We want you to know them. At assets, I mean, investments then um, are categorized by whether they are primary assets or derivative assets. Huh? Well, primary assets are in, are in, come in two flavors, either debt, where you're loaning your money to somebody else, sim similar to a bank. And the bank loans money to you, well, you can loan money to somebody else and get paid interest and principal, or you purchase into the business, into the property, uh, equity as it's called, ownership. And that makes a whole lot of sense, right? I'm either going to lend my money to somebody or I'm going to buy a business or buy a property or some other type of, uh, um, of, of, of investment. Whereas what are derivatives? Well, remember we said that securities are either represent debt or equity or the ability to the, the promise to, to buy or sell. That's what are derivatives. Securities that derive their value from an underlying security or asset. These are normally highly speculative, dear students, which means you're gambling. And all you need to know for chapter one, this is all you need to know about derivatives in this chapter is that they derive their value, hence the word derivative, from something else. And the two major examples, although there are many different types of derivatives, are options and futures. Don't worry about how they work. The book starts talking about them in chapter two. I think that's really stupid. 
Uh, we will get to them at the end of the semester, if only to learn how to stay away from them, because they are radioactive. Yeah, you'll hear people say, I made 100% in one day on my derivative, on my option. And then I lost 100% the next day, which means they went from $100 to $200. And then the next day they went from $200 to $0. That's, yeah, <laughs> losing 100%. So some in the industry, myself included, do not classify derivatives as investments. Okay, cool. So let's continue. Another type of, act, of aspect or characteristic that we uh, ascribe to investments on slide number seven is whether it is a direct investment or an indirect investment. Now, what does this mean? The direct investment means you're in control of the investment. You can buy and sell as you wish. And this is, we'll discuss real estate, stocks, bonds. Indirect investments, somebody else is doing the investment for you. You have limited control or more, more likely no control over the underlying investment. Now, examples of these are mutual funds, real estate investment trusts. That's, the, that's what REIT stands for. That's a great name, REIT. Limited partnerships. You know, you can sell your share of the, of the mutual fund, of the REIT, of the limited partnership, but you don't control what those things invest in. Does that make sense? It will later on, especially when we get to mutual funds. You'll see somebody else is actually making the decisions for you. So for you, it's an indirect investment. That doesn't mean it's not a good investment. If they do a good job, yippee, good for you. But you don't get to decide what gets bought, what gets sold. That's the difference between a direct and an indirect investment. Now, what about domesticity? Isn't that a great name? I don't even, I don't, you don't have to remember it because first of all, it's not easy to say domesticity. Where are the investments based? Well, there are three categories. There's domestic, international, and global. Huh? Wait a minute. Isn't international foreign? Doesn't that same thing as global? No. Be careful of this very subtle distinction. You must know it because you're going to be the investment guru for your friends and family and you can't let them down. Domestic means that the company is based in the United States or the investment is based in the United States. International, also known as foreign, sometimes you'll see overseas, means that it's based outside the United States. And global, of course, is both domestic and international. So think about it, folks. Which one's the most riskiest? Which one's the least riskiest? Which is in the middle? Well, traditionally, it was considered that investments based in the United States were the least risky, whereas investments outside, international, foreign, overseas, were considered the most risky. And then global, obviously, was, a, was in between somewhere. But you know what? That's not true anymore. It's just not true. Some investments outside the United States are far less risky than some investments inside the United States. Plus, Companies don't care about where they're based anymore. They don't care where you send the mail to. Coca-Cola, where is Coca-Cola based? Well, it's the United States company. It's based in Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> All the goings on that's going on in this country now. Um, uh, yeah, but it's a worldwide brand. In fact, it's the most, second most well-known word in the world. Oh, that was, a, that was a mistake. Sorry, go back there. Second most pop, popular, well-known word in the world. What's the first? Okay. Isn't that cool? I love that word. Such a, such a great word. Okay. And, um, and so, uh, yeah. If every United Stater, <laughs> if, every, if every person in the United States has decided they were no longer uh, uh, drink Coca-Cola, Coke would still sell 80%. They'd still be making what they're making 80%. 80% of the money they make comes from outside the United States. So if even if every single person in the United States decided they're not going to drink Coke anymore, it would still be a multinational large corporation. Plus, there are companies that are based outside the United States that do a majority of their business inside the United States. And there's at least one company that's based in the United States that doesn't do a dime of business inside the United States called Philip Morris International. I think they might be moving out of the United States, though. I gotta go check on them. But they're the ones who sell the Marlboro cigarettes and Virginia Dims, uh, Slims uh, 
outside the United States. The company that sells them inside the United States is actually called Altria. So it's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. Let's read what this gentleman had to say from Forbes. Or I'm not sure. I think it was a gentleman, yes. The world is a very small place these days economically. 65% by value of the parts in the Ford Mustang come from the U.S. and Canada. 90% of the parts in the Toyota Sienna, which, by the way, is built in, in Indiana, come from the U.S. and Canada. So which one's the more American car? How do you get more American than a Ford Mustang? You buy a Toyota Sienna. <laughs> And this is something that people just don't understand. You know, they, they just don't get it. They, they, where are most all the Toyotas that are sold in the United States built? In Indiana. Where are most all the Hondas that are sold in the United States built? I think it's Kentucky, right? It's Kentucky. What about BMWs? Bavarian Motorwerken. They're based in South Carolina. And if you go to Mexico and you buy a BMW, where was it built? South Carolina. So you can go to Mexico and build and buy Fords and Chevys and, and Chryslers that were built in Mexico and buy BMWs that were built in the United States. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Yes. Let's take a look at some examples. Now, you know most all these companies, right? Yeah, they sure you do. Where do you think they are based? Either domestic, inside the United States, or foreign, outside the United States. So just think of a couple, you know, and we'll go through them all. Uh, yeah, well, what about Budweiser? Mother Bud, right? Well, you know what? It's actually no longer based in St. Louis. Yes, it's a Belgian-Brazilian company. They changed their name to... Anheuser-Busch InBev, but it really is InBev. How about Shell Oil? They run Houston, but no, they're actually, that's a Royal Dutch Petroleum is their real name, and, and it's actually an Anglo-Dutch consortium. How about Ben & Jerry's? Right? They're based in Vermont. Not anymore. They got bought by Unilever, which is a, a United Kingdom company. Farmers Insurance used to be based in LA. Now it's in Switzerland, Arco, Atlantic Richfield, they are owned by British Petroleum. Gerber, yes, that's a foreign company. So is Carnation, so is Cup of Soup. Fox Network, how do you get more American than Fox Network? In fact, if you don't watch Fox Network, you are obviously a commie, but it's actually based in Australia. Seagram, Seagram's is based in Canada. Bayer Esprit is based in Germany. Vaseline, UK. Friskies is now based in France. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's, Germany, 7-Eleven, Japan. You know, 7-Eleven is a real interesting case study. 7-Eleven, I think it was back in the 80s, right? Uh, they moved, they, they, they started a company, 7-Eleven of Japan, to, to, to move into Japan. And um, it turned out that 7-Eleven Japan just did really, really well. And they got so big that they turned around and bought 7-Eleven in the United States. How about Volvo and Saab, right? Of course, they're, they're foreign. No, they were actually for 20 years domestic. Ford owned a Volvo and GM owned Saab, but not anymore. They sold them. Now Volvo is owned by the Chinese. Gibi or Gibi, I'm not sure. Don't worry, they're still built in, in uh, Sweden. And Saab is owned by some small um, um, Dutch company. I forget exactly the name, but... But they're very, they're very good cars, right? They just never sold enough to be profitable in, United, profitable in the United States. So they sold them off. And now we'll see what happens with Volvo and Saab. Although, I don't need, even... Can you still buy Saabs in the United States? I don't think so. But don't worry. These companies, they're, they're big companies, folks. And, and, and Volvo builds a lot of trucks. And Saab uh, used to uh, build uh, um, fighter jets. Well, I, I, think, I think they're still involved in air aeronomics, but I don't think they build fighter jets anymore. So, so yeah, the companies that you think are basically United States are not. And, and some companies that are United States based do much, as we said, a pr huge percentage of their, of, their work, uh, of their money outside the United States, of their earnings, I'm sorry, of their earnings outside the United States. 
But the world is global. It's a very small place economically, as that one gentleman said. Okay, let's continue. Global investing. So here are the top 18 countries according to per capita income in alphabetical order. Which country had the best average annual return over the past 40 years? Hmm? Hmm? What do you think it is? Yeah, well, it turns out it's not the United States. It's Sweden. The Netherlands. Denmark. Wait a minute. Those commies, they have socialized medicine. How could they outdo the United States of America? Uh, yeah, <laughs> they believe in capitalism too, folks. And, but wh whoa, what's going on with Japan and Italy and Spain? Why, why are they near the bottom? Well, we are going to study finance and investing, which is, you know, part of economics. But what really drives economics, folks, once you start, you know, digging, 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 is demographics. And that's a fancy word for the study of the people. It is very difficult to grow your economy when the number of people in your country is shrinking, as it is in Japan and Italy and Spain. As their population is aging, they are having fewer and fewer babies. And that is something that you sometimes hear people screaming about here in the United States. But the United States, we've always increased our population by immigration. That's traditionally how we've done it. And of course, in the last four years, <laughs> we've had a gentleman occupying a very important position in our country who has denigrated immigrants uh, as part of his, uh, his push to, to get into the White House. So... That was going to change. That's going to change very, very soon. Why? Because we need those people, believe it or not. I know you might think I'm crazy, and you may be right, but the United States needs immigration. Uh, it's been our way of growing our economy and bringing in uh, people who, who love our country and have, and I don't want to get into all the politics. I apologize. But people think it's, you know, oh, Payano, he's a bleeding heart liberal. No, 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 you don't understand. I want to make money. <laughs> I want our economy to grow. And that's how we have grown the economy and brought in the best and the brightest. You've heard of Mr. Elon Musk, haven't you? Yeah, well, you know, he wasn't a native United Stater. Uh, <laughs> he was from South Africa, right? So uh, we have been the beneficiary of people wanting to come to our country. What can I say? I'm greedy. I want to. I want to make more money. I want to. I want to. Uh, uh, our economy to grow and our investments to do well. And uh, yeah, and I want everyone in the world to be well fed, well clothed, and well sheltered. So I'm a bit of a bleeding heart at the same time, but I want to make money. So we can have it both ways, can't we? I think so. I think so. And don't worry, folks, we'll come back to this. You may think, well, Piano's denigrating the United States. No, 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 no. We're going to come back to this. Just remember this. Study and remember this slide because we'll come back to it. Now, um, we also have to remember that investments have a time frame. And actually, the time frame is one of the most important things that we look at whenever we decide what kind of investment we're going to we're going to uh, use. The investment world uses short term, intermediate term, and long term. If you've taken accounting, you'll know that accountants just use what they call current, which is short term, less than a year, and any, everything else is long term. Well, we don't think that way. Uh, and these guidelines are you know squishy. They're they're, they're depend you know depends on who you talk to. But short-term investments are investments up to a year or so, right? Intermediate-term investments are investments that are two, three, five years. And long-term investments are generally considered five or more years, although I take a little longer view. And again, it's up to you. You decide. But short-term for me is one, two, even three years. 
maybe you're saving for a house and it's going to take you two, three years. You want that money to be guaranteed or pretty darn close. So you want it in short-term investments. Intermediate term, three, five, maybe six or seven. Long term for me is 10, 20, 30 years. And we'll discuss the benefit of time uh, throughout the semester. Cool? So remember, remember, you're studying all these terms that we're learning. They're all in the study guide. Okay. And then, is your investment liquid or illiquid? Huh? How much beer do we have for the weekend? No, not that type of liquidity. Liquidity in the investment world means can you easily and quickly convert your investment into cash? There is a ready market to purchase the investment and the change of ownership happens quickly. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate investment trusts, these are all liquid investments as we will see. Somebody wants your 100 shares of McDonald's, <laughs> so they will buy it. Now, illiquid investments are the investments that sometimes are difficult or, or impossible to convert into cash. There's a small, in, the market is small, or the change of ownership happens slowly, or both. The poster child for this type of investment is real estate. You can't just sell your house overnight. It doesn't work that way, or it takes three, six, nine months. Now, sometimes there are what we call you know, bubbles in the, in the real estate bubble of the mid-2000s. You put the sign out on Thursday, and by Sunday, you had five, six, seven offers, and you wrote the, uh, the sales agreement on Sunday, and the house closed in 30 days. But then during the Great Recession, you couldn't sell the house. Nobody was going to buy it. And the price kept falling and falling and falling. And people went through foreclosures. So, so that's, that's an illiquid investment. And then some partnerships, some collectibles, items, uh, uh, art and the like. It may be difficult or slow for the ownership to change. Now, risk versus return. Risk versus return. Don't worry, folks. We're going to come back to this guy over and over and over again. Risk is the chance that the actual investment returns will differ from what you expect them to be. Now, that's not the typical definition of risk. When you and I think about risk, we think about harm, uh, loss, danger. But that's not what we say. That's not what we, I mean, we, obviously losing money is harm and danger. But we define risk as the, uh, the, the chance that the actual return will differ from what you expected. And, it, and we're going to spend a, quite a bit of time on this. So don't get, don't get too hung up on it. But just write it down. Risk. The, different, the chance that the actual investment differs from what we expected it to be. In general, the higher the expectation of investment returns, the higher the risk level. Do you want to eat well or do you want to sleep well? <laughs> and so here are my guidelines. And, and some people are going to you know, think I'm a little bit too, uh, too uh, risk averse. And I don't think I am. I, I'm being the most realistic that I believe. And of course, there's room for other, uh, I, other um, points of view. I consider low risk anywhere from 3 to 5%, moderate 5 to 8%, high risk 8, 9, 10, 11, 12%, and anything greater than 12%, folks, in my humble opinion, is speculative. And speculation is often not considered investing. I certainly do not consider it investing. So if you want to get 15, 16, 20%, know that you're going to take on a whole lot of risk. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try as long as you have your eyes wide open. Now, in this day and age, it turns out that low risks, low risk investments aren't returning anywhere near three to five percent. Moderate risk returns are not returning anywhere near, excuse me, five to eight percent. But high risk are still returning eight to twelve percent. So figure that one out. But we'll come back to this later on. In fact, we'll come back to it throughout this semester. Risk versus return. Risk versus return. Do you want to eat well or do you want to sleep well? And as we said, we're going to do our best to help you eat well, reasonably well, and sleep reasonably well by learning 
the the ins and outs, uh, digging deeply into the investments, and showing you that if we take a long term perspective, then the risks tend to um, uh, smooth out over time. We we tend to do well over time, unless the world ends, and then it doesn't matter where you put your money. But I don't expect that to happen. I mean, we know the world is going to end, folks. In about a billion or two billion years, the, the Earth is going to get swallowed up by the sun. But you don't have to worry about that anytime soon. That's another billion years. Uh, slide number 14. Okay, so now we're going to throw it all together. All those terms that we went through, they weren't that hard, were they? Don't worry about the details. This is the, the, uh, the, uh, the, we're, in the we're looking at it from very far away. Just Study those aspects, study those characteristics, and be able to, to uh, point out the difference between uh, security or property, debt or equity, a direct or an indirect investment, domestic or foreign, short-term, intermediate term, long-term, low, moderate, high risk, on w and whether something is liquid or illiquid. So here are some examples. A Bank of America passbook savings account. Passbook save, yeah, no, we don't use. Well, actually, I, I've heard some students say they still get a passbook account. It looks like a, a passport, and and they're really cool for kids because the kid brings in their two dollars and thirty cents that they made from selling a lemonade or whatever, and they would stamp it. They would stamp the passbook, and it looked really official. But it's all electronic now. So this is a savings account at Bank of America. So is this a security or property? This is security, right? It's a financial investment. It's not a property. Is it debt or equity? It's debt. W what? Debt? Yes. You are lending your money to Bank of America. Yeah, and they're paying you interest, <laughs> such as it is, and they promise to repay the, uh, the, uh, the uh, savings. See, see, everything is different. When you're a bank, it's all reversed. You know, for, when we put money in the bank, that's a debt on the bank's statement. It's an asset on our statement. We own that debt. Uh, when we make a loan, that loan is their asset. It's our debt. So the banks are, everything's reversed. Is it direct or indirect? Well, your name's on the passbook savings account, so it's direct. Is it domestic or foreign? Bank of America? Yes, it is a domestic, still a domestic entity. It used to be based in San Francisco. Now I think it's based in somewhere in North Carolina. Short-term, intermediate term, or long-term? Well, as we'll learn, savings accounts should be considered short-term, although some people consider them intermediate or long-term. But they're paying so little amount now that you would not want to keep your money there for the long term. And we'll learn more about this in, more later on in this, in, this, in this chapter. Is it low, moderate, or high risk? It is one of the lowest risk investments you can ever make. Why? Because it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government or an agency of the government, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So that if Bank of America went bankrupt, which it's not going to do, but if they were to go bankrupt, the feds would swoop in and make sure you get paid your savings. Is it liquid or illiquid? Actually, it's very liquid. You walk into Bank of America and they will give you your money. Now, if you ask for it in cash, they might say, uh, come back tomorrow because <laughs> they don't keep that much money in the branches. Uh, but, uh, but don't ask for it in cash. You'll, they'll just have to call the FBI who will run a background check on you. So, yeah, that's part of the Patriot Act. How about Nestle's food? Who, are, who is Nestle? Anyway, it's the world's largest food company. Yeah. They own a lot of the products that you consume. A lot of times you don't even know they're owned by Nestle. Are they a security or property? Well, it is a security. It is a financial asset. It is a stock. Uh, it means part ownership, as we'll learn in the company. Is it debt or equity? Well, stocks are often considered or called equities because you're part owner of Nestle. Is it indirect or direct? It is direct, because if you bought 100 shares of Nestle, or 5 shares, or however many shares, they're in your account, and you're in charge of them. Your name is on the account. Domestic or foreign? Hmm? Where is the Nestle based? It's a global company, folks. It's, it's basically a country unto itself. It's based in Switzerland, if you can believe that, but it's, it's everywhere in the world. Short-term, intermediate-term, or long-term? 
Well, in general, as we're going to learn, stocks should be considered long term, but it's Nestle. So if you wanted to hold it for the intermediate term, yeah, not bad. Not a bad choice. Short term, stocks generally are not a good idea. Short term, because they can drop 10% in one day, 20% in one day, 50% in three or four months. It's happened in the past. It's going to happen in the future. And I know that scares you, but we're going to learn that the news is good. These drops are perfectly predictable. We know they're going to happen. We have no idea when they're going to happen. And as long as the world doesn't end, the economy bounces back and we are hopeful for a better day tomorrow. Low, moderate, or high risk? Well, again, stocks should be considered fairly high risk, but it's Nestle. So moderate. Is it liquid or illiquid? Yo, it's very liquid. Somebody wants to buy your 10 shares or 100 shares of Nestle. You could sell it tomorrow. Boom. Now, how about the Southwestern College Proposition AA, R bonds, and then I think the Z bonds? What? What, what are these things? Well, Southwestern College went to the voters of the South Bay and said, hey, we're Southwestern Community College. You know, we've been around for over 50 years, and we need some money to, to expand and fix up some of the old buildings. You don't think that we actually had a bake sale to build that stadium, do you? No, we needed tons of cash, and we didn't have it. Um, so we went to the voters, and the voters said, okay, we're okay with that. And the, the voters are well, actually the property holders in the South Bay are paying for those mortgages, essentially those bonds, so that we could fix up the stadium and expand and build the stadium and, and fix up the, uh, the, the, the um, existing buildings and build new buildings. So is that a security or property? It's actually a security. It's a bond. It's a loan. It's money that you lend to Southwestern Community College and Southwestern promises to pay interest and the principal over 30 years. So is it debt or equity? It's debt. We are lending money. That debt is our asset. I know it's hard to think of, but when you think about it, it's not that Makes, it makes sense. We are lending our money to Southwestern College. They promised Southwestern to pay back the interest, pay the interest and the principal. Is it direct or indirect? Well, typically, if you buy individual bonds, it is a direct investment. So you could then turn around and sell them. You're in charge. Domestic or foreign, and I know some people call us Tijuana Tech, but there is an Instituto Tecnologico de Tijuana. We are not uh, foreign. We're domestic. Short-term, intermediate term, or long-term? Well, many people buy bonds for the long-term, but they can also be considered intermediate term. Yeah, Short-term, you don't normally want to buy uh, long-term bonds, which is what these are, for the short-term. We'll discuss bonds in more detail later on. But consider bonds intermediate to long-term. Low, moderate, or high risk? Well, um, moderate, they're not really high risk unless the economy were to fall apart in the uh, South Bay again, as it did in 2008 and 2009, because the property owners come through with their property taxes, and so the bonds will pay the interest and principal. Are they liquid or illiquid? They're fairly liquid, folks. Most people who buy bonds are, first of all, very wealthy, and they hang on to them. But if they wanted to sell them, Somebody is going to want to buy their uh, Southwestern College bonds, certainly. Uh, we have a very good credit rating, and we'll discuss credit rating ratings later on when we get to bonds. Now, what about a duplex in Spring Valley? You rent one, and you live in the other. Is that a security or property? It's a property. It's real estate. Now, I have always thought that was a silly name, real estate. Why is anything real? because it's attached to the ground, <laughs> or it is ground. So once you attach something to the ground, it's now called real property, as opposed to imaginary property. I don't like that term. But anyway, that's the term. And so it is a property. It is a debt or equity. It is equity. You are owner of that property. Your name is on the uh, title, it is down at the, uh, the, the county admin building. Is it direct or indirect? You are in charge. It is a direct investment. 
Now, domestic or foreign, obviously domestic, United States, Spring Valley. Is it short-term, intermediate-term, or long-term? Well, in my humble opinion, real estate should always be considered a long-term investment, notwithstanding all the, re the, the reality, disreality, unreality television shows that teach you how to pro uh, flip property. Don't do it. <laughs> um, real estate should be considered a long-term investment. And like stocks, the news is good. If you hold on for the long term, you should do well. But unlike stocks, real estate is very, very tricky. I like the term, I like to use the term tricky, which is a euphemism. What a pain in the patootie. What a pain in the ugh. And so uh, we'll discuss real estate later on. Should we consider it low, moderate, or high risk? Well, it depends. A lot of it depends on what price you pay and what interest rate you get and what what is the desirability of the property. Can you rent it easily or will it be empty for quite some time? So, so real estate, as we said, is very, very tricky. But consider it moderate to high risk until you've had it for quite some time and then if it's uh, you know if it turns out to be a good property, it's fairly low risk. Then you can usually do very well. Is it liquid or illiquid? Well, it turns out that real estate is the poster child for illiquid investments. It takes time for you to sell your real estate, but that doesn't mean it's not a good investment. It's just you need to understand that real estate is not something you can easily sell quickly. There are companies that will buy it from you cash for $400,000 less or $100,000 less than what it's worth. Thank you very much. <laughs> they're called vulture capitalists. Uh, and there's a reason why they're called vulture capitalists. But yeah, you know, if you need to sell it in 30 days, they'll be very happy to, uh, to buy it from you for $200,000 less than what it's worth. Now, what about Qualcomm? Well, it was a stadium, wasn't it? And it's supposed to be all uppercase. I don't like writing it that way, but that's the way it's supposed to be. It's one of the few major companies that is based in the in San Diego area, isn't it? Right. We have a lot of small companies. Some are incredibly powerful and, and cool, but not too many very large companies. And it used to be a stadium, right? But not anymore. Now they're tearing it down. But what does Qualcomm make? Huh? People say, well, they make cell phones. No, they don't make cell phones. Um... They make chips. No, they don't even make the chips. They design the chips and they get somebody else to buy, sell them, to, buy, to build them. I'm sorry, somebody else to build them. But that's where they make most of their money off of. They also designed the system called CDMA, which has been morphed into other things. CDMA stands for can't do much of anything. No, I'm sorry. Uh, code division multiple access. And it's one of the two major systems that power our cell phones. So they're very much involved in the telecommunications industry, and now their chips are powering many, many uh, uh, mobile and other devices too. So are they a security or property? They're a security. They're a stock. You buy 100 shares of Qualcomm, you're buying 100 shares of the stock that is, that is, that is um, Qualcomm. Is it debt or equity? It is equity. It is ownership. You are part owner of the Qualcomm Corporation. Is it direct or indirect? Well, you are in charge. The, your name is on the account where the stocks are being held, so it is direct. It, is it domestic or foreign? Well, we know it's based in the, United, in the United States, it's based in San Diego, but they make more money outside the United States than they do inside the United States. So is it really a United States company? Yeah, where they get their mail is not as important as where they earn their income. Is it short-term, intermediate-term, or long-term? Well, as we said, stocks should almost always be considered long-term. But with these very high risk, I just gave you the, the, <laughs> the answer to the next question. With these high-tech companies, which you know, many of them are very high risk, we might want to play the game where we might be ready to sell at a moment's notice which is called speculation, which I'm not too excited about personally, but you may think of it that way. But in general, I'm going to do my best to explain to you, to impress upon you that when you buy a stock, you should be thinking long-term. 
five, seven, ten years. We'll discuss this in detail later on and see that there's a few subtleties to this time frame. Now, low, moderate, or high risk. Well, in the this high tech world where things change very quickly, I would consider Qualcomm high risk because now we hear that a company called Apple, you might have heard of them, is now building their own chips that will probably uh, one up both Intel's architecture and Qualcomm's architecture. So we'll see what happens with that. Is it liquid or illiquid? Well, we said stocks are very liquid. Yes, somebody wants your 100 shares of Qualcomm. So tomorrow you fire up your laptop or your cell phone or whatever, and you could sell your 100 shares of Qualcomm. Now, our last example is a loan to Uncle Harry. Yes, dear students, every family has an Uncle Harry, Tio Lucas, whatever, the good for nothing. Is it a security or property? Well, it's a security. It's a financial investment. Is it debt or equity? It's debt. You lent him the money and he promised to pay you back. Is it direct or indirect? It's direct because you're in charge. You own it. Is it domestic or foreign? Well, he's still here in San Diego, but I hear he might be thinking of moving to Aruba or maybe he'll get a postcard somewhere. Short term, intermediate term, long term, or forever term. Do you think you're going to get your money back from Uncle Harry? <laughs> Low, moderate, high, very high risk. Liquid or illiquid, very illiquid because nobody else in the family is going to buy your debt from him and then have Uncle Harry owe them the money. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully now, with these terms, you have an idea of where we can pigeonhole certain different, different types of investments. Go back over, study these terms, because we will uh, ascribe these, these qualities, these characteristics to the investments that as we go forward, we'll discuss. And in our next chapter, we will get a little closer. We'll get a little closer at the various uh, segments, various uh, alternatives, investment alternatives, in what we call our overview of the investment universe. So are you excited, dear students? Are you? I hope so, because I, 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 I'm not biased or anything, but I love this stuff. It is exciting. There's no end to, to what you're going to learn in the world of investments. That's the really, really cool part. There's another part of it that tends to, as we will discuss the emotions, we're going to deal with uncertainty. We're going to, there's going to be times when we really don't know which way to go. We, we're going to be second guessing ourselves. And, and, and that's part of the investment experience. And we'll learn how to deal with both the intellectual part, which, as Mr. Warren Buffett says, is fairly simple, and the emotional part, the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty. That, that is the part that ain't easy. <laughs> but it's so exciting, in my humble opinion. So... Thank you, thank you, thank you once again for being in our class. We want this to be the best class you've ever taken. Study, study every day. Tell me what you think of, of the closed captioning. Is it helpful? Can you even read it? If you're looking at it on one of your on a cell phone, I guess you can't even read it. But um, thank you so much for being in our class. And all of us at Southwestern are proud and happy and honored that you're here. And we'll see you in our next presentation the overview of the investment universe where we get a little closer to the major alternative investments. See ya!